Hello, friends, and welcome to our Sabbath School lesson. We are in lesson number six, which is the hour of his judgment. We're studying the three cosmic messages, quarter number two, 2023, and we are so glad that you have joined us. This is an important message. It's a vital message. It's a solemn message. It is a message of good news. And we're going to be breaking down that message in the context of the judgment hour revealed in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Before we do that, I'd like to introduce our illustrious panel uh, that are going to be studying the Bible with us today. On my left, my immediate left, is Pastor John Loma King. Pastor? Good to be here. And I'm covering the 2300 days and the time of the end. That's going to be exciting days study. Study. Sounds good. And to your left, we have Pastor John Denzi. Pastor, good to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. And another interesting lesson, Tuesday, the angel's instruction to Daniel. Oh, the angel's instruction to Daniel. Okay, and to your immediate left is Bible expositor, <laughs> Ellie Quinn. I just Sister like being Quinn. part of the illustrious panel. <laughs> I have Wednesday's lesson, The Messiah Cut Off. Oh, amen. And then to your immediate left is Pastor Ryan Day. Pastor, good to have you here with us. What Blessing do you have? always. And we're going to be covering Thursday's lesson, the year 1844. 1844. So we're covering everything here in our lesson today. But before we get started, before we jump in, we're going to have a word of prayer. And I'd ask, like to ask Pastor John to pray for us sure. as we get started. Loving Father in heaven, as we continue in this study on the three cosmic messages, we do pray that you'll attend mm -hmm. our minds today for the clear proliferation of the truths that are contained in it, that our hearts will be led of your Holy Spirit. Lord, mm -hmm. come now and fill us that what we speak may be truth and hearts may be changed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's been such a powerful study so far, of these three cosmic messages. And of course, the Sabbath School Quarter uh, author, Mark Finley, is really helping us to dig into these lessons. Lots of good insights here um, from that man of God. So Sabbath afternoon, we have the hour of his judgment based on these texts from the, the Bible. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, Ezra 7, Matthew 3, 13 to 17, Romans 5, 6 through 9, very key verses right there in Romans chapter 5, Mark 15, 38, and Leviticus 16, 16. Our memory text is found in Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. So let's take a look at those verses, shall we? And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is is at hand. So Paul here is urging believers to get ready, to prepare, to put on the armor of God, to do this because we know that the time is near. And indeed, as we study the judgment hour, we're going to know that the time is at hand. The time of Christ's second coming is at hand because his coming is going to come following the finalization, the finishing up of the judgment hour. So when we look at the lesson, beginning in, in uh, Sunday's lesson, we have a basic overview of what God is wanting to do for us in a uh, story, an illustration that's given of this hen that covers her chicks during a fire. She is completely destroyed by the fire, but as uh, these people come through to the burned area and they, they find this, this pile of feathers as they kick the feathers aside, all these chicks, these live chicks come out from under that pile of feathers. And this is exactly what God wants to do for us in the time of judgment. He wants to cover us with the righteousness, that is the right doing, the right living, the perfect uh, holy life of Jesus, and of course, his death in our behalf, his substitutionary death. Psalm 91 talks about being covered by his feathers and dwelling under his wings. Psalm 91 is a great psalm to memorize, to help us to remember the the work of God in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary in, in, as our mediator. And so the fires of God's judgment burn themselves out on Jesus Christ, the quarterly goes on to say at Calvary. And all who are in Christ are safe forever beneath his wings. At the cross, Christ was judged as a condemned sinner so that we could be judged 
as righteous citizens of the heavenly kingdom. He became yeah. sin for us. He didn't sin. He didn't deserve the wages of sin. He didn't deserve to be treated as, as a sinner, but he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. We don't deserve the righteousness of God. We didn't earn the righteousness of God. Just like he didn't deserve sin and the consequences, we don't deserve his righteousness, but it's a gift. And God has given that gift to us in Jesus Christ. This is what we need to stand in the judgment. He was judged as a criminal so that we could be set free from the destructive fires of eternal loss, both figuratively and yes, literally as well. So let's go into Sunday's lesson. That was actually Sabbath's lesson. I mentioned it was Sunday, it was Sabbath's lesson. Let's go into Sunday's lesson. It's called the cleansing of the sanctuary. And we're gonna read Daniel chapter eight and verse 14. So if you'd like to open your Bibles there to Daniel chapter eight and verse 14. This verse is a key verse, a foundational verse for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Daniel 8 and verse 14, here's what it says. And he sent unto me unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this is the longest prophecy in Bible history. We don't see any prophecy that is longer than this one. In fact, it takes in all of the other time prophecies of the Bible. We understand those days to be prophetic days. So when we look at prophetic days, we interpret them as literal years. So we could say this is the 2300 prophetic day or 2300 literal year prophecy in the book of Daniel. It stretches all the way from 457 BC to AD 1844. And encapsulated in that prophecy is this beautiful picture of the anointing of the Messiah who would come to do away with our sins, our transgressions, and our iniquities. And we're gonna break that open as we study it more here in our Sabbath school lesson. So each uh, of the Jewish believers, each of the Hebrews understood the meaning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Sometimes we can read that, you know, the, the, the history of our church uh, goes back to the Millerite movement and they understood the cleansing of the sanctuary to mean the cleansing of the earth by fire when Jesus returns. But if they would have asked a Hebrew, he would have said, no, 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 no. The cleansing of the sanctuary has to do with the day of atonement, the day of judgment. It has to do with the final blotting out of sins, the record of sin that's there between the holy in the most holy place on the curtain recorded there by the blood of all those sacrifices, those daily sacrifices that was gonna have a final atonement. It's kind of like, you know, every day uh, you take out your garbage. You know, your garbage gets uh, full in your house and you, the sack gets full and you, if you're like me, you go around to the offices and the bathrooms and you throw everything in there and you take it out to the garbage can. But once a week, the garbage collector comes and the garbage collector takes that garbage to the dump. That's now, right. as long as that garbage is out of your house, you're good. But it still needs to be taken to the dump. It's still on your premises, right? Mm -hmm. So these sins were recorded in the sanctuary, but finally there was going to be this garbage day of atonement, so to speak, the day when these sins were going to be taken to the dump, they were going to be placed on the scapegoat, they were going to go out into the wilderness to be returned no more. But Daniel didn't understand this. Daniel was struggling with this. When you look in Daniel chapter 8, as he gets to the end of this vision, Daniel chapter 8, verse 27, he says, Then I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business and was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now, I love this about Daniel because Daniel here is revealing a humility of knowledge. He doesn't understand the vision and he's willing to admit that. You know, sometimes we don't understand something biblically, especially if we've been in for a few decades. We're like, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> but Daniel says, I don't know what this is. And Daniel is an old man at this time. He's willing to recognize that he's not sure what this 2300 day prophecy is really all about. Now he understands, as we said, the terminology of the cleansing of the sanctuary, but when Daniel's here in Medo-Persia, there's no sanctuary to be cleansed. <laughs> the sanctuary has been destroyed and it hasn't been restored yet. So he can't figure this out. I thought there was gonna be seven years and we were gonna be restored to our land and the sanctuary was gonna be rebuilt. What is this 2300 day prophecy? Daniel seemingly understands that it's a long time. In fact, it's probably in his mind easily a day for a year. And so Daniel begins to pray. And when we read Daniel chapter 9, verses specifically 21 and 22, he gets an answer to his prayers. While he's speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom he had seen at the vision in the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and he talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, I am come forth to give thee skill and understanding. 
Verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, it's really important that we recognize the connection here between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. What vision? There's no vision that's been given him in Daniel chapter 9. So what vision is Gabriel talking about? Well, he's talking about the vision that Daniel didn't understand in Daniel chapter 8, the vision that he prayed for understanding for in Daniel chapter 9, and the only vision that is connected to Daniel's prayer. That is the 2300-day prophecy. And so Gabriel comes to give him an understanding of this prophecy and expound upon it as, as Daniel is struggling to understand it. Gabriel tells him the significance between the death of Jesus Christ revealed in Daniel chapters 24 to 9, 24 to 27 and the judgment. Now the significance is found in one verse, at least the part I'd like to share with you is found in one verse. We're all going to expound a little bit more upon this, but I want you to look at verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thine holy city to finish transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. There are four tasks outlined here. There's actually seven in the text, but there are four tasks outlined here that are connected directly with Jesus Christ. You see, finishing transgression, making an end of sins, and making reconciliation for iniquity is, are tasks that only Jesus Christ could do if you have your new covenant glasses on. Now, if you're thinking Old Covenant, you're thinking, oh, we got to do all of this stuff before, you know, this Messiah comes. But if you're thinking New Covenant, you read verse 25 and you recognize only Jesus could do this. Know therefore and understand, verse 25 says, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's 69 weeks. In other words, these tasks have to be accomplished. They can only be accomplished by Jesus and therefore he must come before the 70 weeks are done. I'm going to give you 69 weeks to figure out you can't do it on your own. Uh, I think Abraham needed about 25 years to figure that out, right? And once you figure that out, when Messiah comes, you're going to embrace him. You're going to rejoice over him. You're going to be happy for him. But you've got to remember that he's going to come, Isaiah 53, to bear your sins and your transgressions and your iniquities because he's going to be the one that's going to get you through the judgment. And the only way you can get through the judgment is to have your sins, your transgressions, and your iniquities atoned for. If you atone for them, you're lost, you're dead, you're done, you're out. But if Jesus atones for them in your place, you have the gift of salvation. And that's the connection between this 2300 day prophecy and the judgment. In the judgment, we have a mediator. In the judgment, probation is open. In the judgment, we have someone who propitiates for our sins, someone who stands in our behalf and pleads his righteousness, his right living, and his righteous death, substitutionary death in our behalf. And you know what 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 say? He's not just the propitiation for our sins. He's the propitiation. He's the sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. And that's why the judgment is good news for every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. You, whoever you are, the ends of the earth, you have a mediator, you have an intercessor, you have a savior in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Lay the foundation. We're going to go for some of the similar things because mine is the 2300 days and the time of the end or the end time. And we're in Daniel 8. Let's look at that again, Daniel chapter 8. And I'm going to look at verses 17 to verses 19, because a part of the vision is the timing of it. You know, some expositors or some theologians argue that this is a literal 2,300 year period, which would be about nine years after Daniel was given the vision, but that's not possible because it was clear. Days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I said 2300 days. A lot of people think it's a literally 2300 day period, but um, it could not be because this is not the time frame that the prophecy is set in because verse 19 says time of the end and time of the end is the most significant part because it has a beginning point in the prophecy and then it has an ending point and each of the components of the prophecy is to outline a certain aspect of the ministry of Christ, as James pointed out. There are certain aspects of this, and I'll just go over that very quickly. The, the seven things are the purpose of the seven weeks. In verse 24 is 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So right away, Daniel knows that is specifically pointing to the Jewish people to finish the transgression. 
which was a, a journey that they were on, they continually struggled with transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So when you look at the cadence of this, Daniel even outlines the aspects of it that make it clear that also the time that Daniel is given this vision is brought out in verses 9, verses 23, and verses 24. Let's look at verse 9 of Daniel 8. Let me turn there. I have it in my lesson, but I want to go ahead and look at it in the Bible. Okay. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now, this little horn that's referred to is the, the power of Rome growing in its ascendancy. But now, now you'll notice in verse 23, the pulling together of this. And in the latter time of their kingdom... When the, transgressor, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy People. Now, it's interesting that the Bible points out that this power is not from him. When you look at the rise of Rome again in Revelation chapter 13, it makes it clear where the power is coming from. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So the persecu persecuting power behind the people of God is not just Rome as a government or Rome as a system or Rome as a political movement or Rome even as a religio-political system, but the motivating power behind that is the very one who resists truth, who resists light, and that is Satan himself giving rise to that power. The Bible also points out some other aspects. Look at verse 10 and 12 of Daniel chapter 8. Speaking about the little horn, and it grew up to the hosts of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts. And by him, the daily sacrifice were taken away. The daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. In verse 12, because of transgression, an army was given over the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Let me add there, prospered temporarily mm -hmm. because God really has the final say. Amen. The powers of Rome, as well as the powers of Medo-Persia, the powers of Babylon and the powers of Greece, each one of those has a temporary time to reign. Only of the kingdom of God does the Bible say his kingdom has no end. Mm -hmm. Pastor Finley points out in the lesson, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, 14, the climax of the chapter is God's answer to the challenge of earthly and religious powers that have attained or attempted to usurp the authority of God. It is part of God's divine solution to the sin problem. So let's look at the prophecy in its full scope. You have the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem, and then aspects, there are timelines throughout it. And even though there are events that are opposing the people of God through it, Eventually, the Messiah shows up 69 weeks later to bring the answer, mm -hmm. to bring the answer to the sin problem, mm -hmm. not just the powers that reign, to bring the answer to the sin problem. Mm -hmm. Why is he called Messiah? Acts 10.38, because he was baptized, he was anointed, and the Messiah is the only one that can bring an end to any of the problems of sin, mm -hmm. not another earthly kingdom. Mm -hmm. His kingdom shall not be left to other people, the Bible says in Daniel 7. This is a kingdom that has no end. So the Messiah comes and he is anointed in baptism. We find there in Matthew chapter 3, the baptism. But then in Matthew chapter 4, this is very interesting. Go there with me. Let me show you how head on Jesus comes to confront the issues of sin. And uh, I've often told people that are baptized, uh, rejoice on your baptismal day. 
humbly and <laughs> cautiously. <laughs> Because what is true of Jesus is very true of many of us. Matthew chapter 4. Then, this is following the baptism. This is following the declaration, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then verse 4. Then Jesus was led up, notice, by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Is it ironic? We talked about the church in the wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness. The church was tempted in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. The church faltered in the wilderness. Jesus was victorious in the wilderness. Look at verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now I want you to notice here the focal point of Daniel we may get caught up in the days and the hours and the, liter the literality, the literality of the 2,300 year period, but the 2,300 year period is the parent, is the parent. The 70 weeks is the child. Now I use that terminology in web design because you have the overall page, which is the parent and components in the page are considered the child. So the 2,300 year period is the parent. It encompasses the whole timeline from the decree all the way to 1844, mm -hmm. as James pointed out. But in the middle of that is the child of the parent, which outlines the ministry of Christ mm -hmm. included in that last week where Jesus is anointed, where Jesus is cut off in the middle of a week, not for himself, mm -hmm. but for us. And then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And the part of the prophecy of the Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel that are so significant in that last week, it says he shall confirm his covenant with many for one week. Who is that referring to? Christ. And here is the dichotomy or the ir irony of this prophecy. You see that last year, that last seven year period is what rapturists and dispensationalists take out of the prophecy. Mm -hmm. The Bible refers to it as uh, the anointed, the Messiah. Messiah, Messiah, repetitively mentioned in Daniel 9, verse 24 to 27. It's referred to, to the Christ, but rapturous and dispensationalists take that one week period and they push it far into the future and they apply it to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And so people are looking for something that's not going to occur. Today, there are many people waiting for the sacrificial system to be reinstated, but it was ended at the crucifixion of Christ mm -hmm. because right. the real sacrifice the real messiah had already come Amen. but today we have a whole nation of jews waiting for the coming of the messiah we have people on earth that are evangelicals waiting for the temple uh, sacrificial system to be reestablished re the red heifer as it were mm -hmm. for the jews to be converted and take the gospel to the world let me just make a statement that's very clear and very concise according to scripture the jews will no more be converted today than they were in the time of Christ as a nation. Is salvation available for everyone? For everyone, the Jew and the Gentile and every other nationality. But as a people, mm -hmm. the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. And that's why the gospel that we're talking about, the everlasting gospel, Revelation chapter 14, the hour of God's judgment, is not just for a specific nation, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the focal point of the prophecy is salvation in Christ. Amen. 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 Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Well, there you have it. We've gotten a good start on this message on the hour of God's judgment. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back, friends. We're continuing our study on the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we are in Tuesday's lesson, The Angel's Instruction to Daniel. Pastor John Denzi. 
Thank you. Yes, the, the angel's instruction to Daniel brings us into Daniel chapter 9. And uh, I'm going to back up the lessons uh, points out verse 23 because this is very important because the angel is coming to give instruction to Daniel. But before this, Daniel had some kind of preparation he was making. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. And so this is something vital in my uh, understanding because uh, God wants us to do the same thing Daniel was doing. What was he doing? He was confessing his sins and confessing the sins of his people. But he was praying to the Lord. He was in communion with the Lord. His, his heart was prepared to, uh, to receive the message from this angel. And the same thing, God will also talk to us. He may not send an angel, but if you're asking the Lord for help to understand something, he will send someone or he will lead you to the scriptures that will help you understand the things you need to understand. We'll look at a verse in a moment about that. But notice now verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Mm. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. God loved Daniel. He was a man after his own heart, I could say, he was a dedicated person to the Lord and for, and for many, many years. Now, uh, now he says, consider the matter and understand the vision. He came to help him understand. The lesson brings this out, and I'd like to read it directly. The angel plainly instructed Daniel to consider the matter and understand the vision. What matter? <laughs> what vision? You see, there is no vision recorded in Daniel chapter 9. And you must remember that the scriptures were not organized according to chapter. This was brought in by people. So the vision has to be uh, before this Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. So as you go before Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, you have to find a vision. Where is this vision found? It is in Daniel chapter 8. So this is within the context of the vision that was presented to him before. What vision is that? Uh, it has been mentioned before, but I need to do it again. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And this is a day for a year. We're going to look at that in a moment. So the lesson says Gabriel must be speaking of the portion of the vision in Daniel chapter 8 that, that the prophet did not understand the vision of the 2,300 days. This is what the angel came to help him understand. And so here, uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 27. Notice Daniel, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. And perhaps he even talked to his uh, uh, brethren of, of, of confidence. Hey, I had this vision, but I can't understand this thing. And he was uh, sick. I mean, this is somebody that wants to understand the vision. And the Lord answered his prayer. Uh, I'd like to bring this out to you in, from Jeremiah 33, verse 2 and 3. Uh, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Mm -hmm. God is willing to do this for us as well. What should we do? We need to prepare our heart. We need to be studying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Studying the scriptures, seeking to understand and asking the Lord for the blessing. Asking the Lord for the Holy Spirit so that we may uh, be blessed to understand the scriptures. And sometimes you may find a portion of the scriptures that, boy, I really don't understand that. Keep digging. Keep asking the Lord for answers. And you can ask people of confidence, people that you know are close to the Lord. Hey, I don't, under I don't understand this. Has the Lord given you insight into this area? And blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord will bless you. And it may take sometimes days as Daniel. 
and sometimes weeks. I've had a case for months for myself, <laughs> months. I didn't understand. I was praying to the Lord, Lord, help me to understand. Help. And you know, the time came when the Lord says, you're ready now. <laughs> Here it is. Praise be to his name. So let's go ahead and go now to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It has already been mentioned. This is a, a, uh, a message that continues to build and build upon uh, one another. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Daniel 9, 24 and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This is a scripture that is uh, uh, vital for God's people to understand. Daniel 9, uh, beginning in verse 24, all the way to the end of the chapter, we need to understand this prophecy. And this is what we're trying to bring to your attention here. This is a message for the time of the end. And we need to understand this. And in a moment, you're going to hear the, the, how this was fulfilled, the 70 weeks. Now, we're talking about 70 weeks. So a week is composed of how many days? It's seven days. Seven days, so 70 times 70 equals 490. Now, the lesson brings something out that is very important. The, the, the verse in Daniel 9, 24, the New King James Version says, 70 weeks I determined for your people. Determined is the word we're going to look at. And this is the word that is chatak. And the word chatak in Hebrew means determined. Another word is cut off. Well, cut off from what? You have to have something uh, in order to cut something out of it. And this again takes us back to the vision in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. So the lesson says the first portion of this prophecy relates to God's people, the Jews. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, that is the Jewish nation. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So where do we get that from? One of the places is Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, 34. We only have time to read one. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. So this is the, uh, one of the scriptures that helps us to understand that in Bible prophecy, one day equals one year. One literal day equals one literal year. So 70 weeks, 70 times 7 is 490 days. But in Bible prophecy, one day equals one year. We're talking about 490. And it's beautiful how the Bible gives us the answer because it even gives us the starting point. So when we begin to count, is prophecy good with, uh, when you mention um, amount of days or years and you don't have a starting point, you're left in the dark still. Well, there's 490 years. Well, where do you begin? And so this is a, a marvelous way to study the Bible, look for answers. And so let's go ahead and go here to uh, the lesson again. It says, Gabriel tells Daniel that 400 uh, years are cut off. The literal meaning of the Hebrew word chatak, sometimes called determined, means cut off. And cut off from the prophecy, the vision in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Let's continue the message that the angel gave to him. We now move to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until... Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. This is equal to 69, of course. The street shall be built again. Notice the details, and you're going to hear about that in a moment. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And you've heard this is talking about Christ. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of that seven year period, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. 
And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. This is really a setup for the rest of the lesson that you will hear, starting with Sister Shelley Quinn. <laughs> I love this. We were saying during our break that uh, we wished we had some graphics, but there's enough <laughs> repetition here. Perhaps our words, our feeble words, can help you understand. I'm Shelley Quinn. Wednesday's lesson is the Messiah Cutoff. What I want to explain for some people who may not realize this, there are different methods of uh, prophetic interpretation. We follow the historicist method, which follows the flow of history from antiquity to the end of the world. And it's important to note that futurists, when you were talking about those who are, are cutting off in uh, the final week and putting it down at the end, this was born during the Counter-Reformation to try to offset the clear finger pointing at the religio-political power. So let's go back here. That was probably clear as mud. In Daniel 8, 14, we've got the 2300 day prophecy till the cleansing of the sanctuary, 2300 years. That's a day for a year. Let's read Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks are determined, they're decreed for whom? For your people, Daniel, that would be the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So 70 weeks, seven days in a week, that's a 490 day prophecy, the literal day for a year. It's a 490 year prophecy is determined for God's purposes to finish the work with the Jewish nation. The first 490 years of these 2300, if we take it out, it's divided into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and a final week. 70 weeks are cut off right from the beginning of this 2300 day prophecy and set aside for the Jewish nation to come into compliance with God's requirements. The remaining 1810 years are for all nations. But I want to make this point. These are 70 consecutive weeks. There's seven weeks plus 62 weeks plus the final week. You cannot look at a 70 week prophecy and as futurist interpret, lock that final week off, put it way down here at the end of time, then it would be a 69 week prophecy. No, it's a 70 week prophecy. Daniel 9, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 of those 70 weeks. What's he saying? In 69 weeks, 483 years, the Messiah's coming. Yeah. The Jews shouldn't have mentioned, missed it. I'm, this is the most exciting time mm -hmm. prophecy in the whole Bible that he's saying from the time that this command goes forth to rebuild and establish Jerusalem. And when you think about that, how do we know when this began? There were various decrees that were passed regarding Jerusalem, but it was King Artaxerxes degree that's recorded in Ezra 7, 13 and 27 that was issued in the autumn of 457 BC. 
that fulfills this prophecy because not only were they going to be able to return to their homeland, but they could establish themselves once again as a religious community. So from the time of this decree, from 457, you go forward seven weeks plus 62 weeks, 69 weeks times seven, that's 483 years. From 457 BC, add 483, and what do you get? 27 AD. So what happened in 27 AD? Jesus was baptized. The Messiah was anointed. The Holy Spirit came down on him and lit on him like a dove. So now, what happens to the 70th week? It's all part of that seven weeks, 62 weeks, plus the final week. That's the 70 week prophecy. Listen to this, Daniel 9, 26. After the 62 weeks that followed the 70, the first seven weeks, so that would really be at the end of 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. The word there is karat. It is a covenant word. And here's what Strong's Dictionary, how they define it. To cut off, cut down, fail, cut or make a covenant or agreement. Messiah, Isaiah 53, 8, says that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. God says he was stricken. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. He was cut off, but not for himself. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. The Messiah began his ministry in A.D. Uh, 27. 27. Thank you. My, my, I'm looking down at a reference and I lost it. First Peter 2, 24 backs this up. He says, he's talking about Jesus. He said he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Remember, righteousness by faith is not some mythical uh, impartment to us. It changes us that we live for righteousness. And then he says, by whose stripes you were healed. So Daniel 9, 27 says, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So he arrives, mm -hmm. AD 27 begins his ministry, but it says in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. How much is the middle of a week? If you divide seven into two, it's three and a half years. And Jesus was crucified three and a half years after he began his ministry. So he was cut off in the middle of the week, the old covenant sacrificial system ended because he was the perfect sacrifice. Mark 15, 38 says that when he was crucified, that the veil in the temple, that thick veil was torn asunder, ripped in two from the bottom, or excuse me, from the top to the bottom. No human hand did that. He was cut off at Passover, exactly when the Jewish high priest was offering the Passover lamb, because he is our 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul calls Christ our Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us. Hebrews 13, 20 says, his blood is the blood of the everlasting covenant. But if he was cut off in the middle of the week, how could he, as Daniel uh, 9, 27, say that he would confirm a covenant. This is the last week of that 70 week prophecy. How was he going to confirm it with the Jews the whole 70 weeks if he's cut off in the middle of the week? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 2, 3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was 
confirmed to us by those who heard him. Jesus ministered the first three and a half years for the Jews. He was cut off in the middle of the week and his apostles and disciples ministered to the Jews for the remainder of that week. And you know what happened? There was the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7, 59 through 60. That happened in A.D. 34. Jesus began his ministry A.D. 27. Seven years later, A.D. 34, Stephen was stoned. And I think that was probably the end of that 70-week prophecy. <laughs> I don't think I know. I know, yeah. <laughs> yes. My name is Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled uh, The Year 1844. And, you know, I just have to say everything that, that I've heard so far just from the panel. You guys have done an incredible job. This is to, to break this subject down in less than an hour is just incredible. Um, but I just have to say this, you know, you will never hear this message preached by any other movement other than the Seventh-day Adventist movement. In fact, it was this very message that we're studying today that ultimately convinced me years and years ago that this is God's remnant people. This is God's movement. And there's something to this. There's some truth to this, just how accurate it was and how clear the Word of God was. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing because when you get into Daniel chapter 8, we've talked about this vision, this 2,300 year time prophecy. Uh, but it's interesting that while Daniel received much of the meaning of that vision, as brought out very clearly from uh, Pastor Denzi, there was a portion of that vision that, that Daniel didn't understand. And why? Because the latter verse of Daniel chapter 8 says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I rose and went about the king's business and was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Now understand, it wasn't the whole vision that he didn't understand. It was only a portion of the vision. And it's interesting that in Daniel 8 you have two different words that, that is written in the original language for the word vision. You have kozon, which is talking about the overall vision itself and the portion that Daniel received uh, understanding for. But then when you get down here to this latter verse here, and it's used a few times in in the previous verses in the latter portion of Daniel chapter 8. But it says here talking about, I was astonished by the vision and no one understood it. It's the word mare in the original uh, Hebrew. And it's interesting that when you get over to Daniel chapter 9 and Gabriel shows up, Gabriel shows up and notice what it says in verse 23. He says, at the beginning of your supplications, I, uh, the command went out and I have come to you for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, speaking to Daniel, he says, consider the matter and understand the... Mare. <laughs> it was the portion of the vision before. I only brought that out because so many of my brothers and sisters in Christ from other denominations have said for years trying to combat this Adventist uh, interpretation of this or Adventist movement's understanding of this and saying, oh, you know, Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 have nothing to do with each other. There's no connection. And that's how it leads them to take the 70 weeks that last week, chop it off, send it down at the end of time and apply all the glory to some false backward antichrist uh, system, which again, he eclipses and robs Jesus Christ of his glory, which only it belongs to according to this particular vision. Right. And I only said all of that because we just learned uh, all the way through here that the 490 years, obviously the 70 weeks time prophecy was a probationary time period given to the children of Israel to kind of clean up their act, to get it together as God's last effort to win them over and to use them as his champions, his beacon of light to the rest of the world, to, to, to take the gospel to the world and let them be his special peculiar people. But of course, as a nation, they failed. And we just learned that they murdered their last prophet in 34 AD when they stoned Stephen, therefore sealing up that probationary time period. Even Jesus Christ called it beforehand when he told the leaders of Israel, the Sanhedrin, he said, look, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've wanted to gather you as a hen has gathered her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He says, therefore, your house is left to you desolate. And Daniel uh, chapter nine in the 70 weeks, it clearly tells of that desolate time period that comes as a result of the nation of Israel rejecting uh, Jesus Christ as Messiah. But all of that said, we're talking about the year 1844. How do we get there? Well, we just learned that in 457 BC, according to the command to restore and build Jerusalem, we're talking about a complete restoration of Jerusalem. We're not talking about just a, a decree. There was two or three decrees given by Cyrus and Artaxerxes to go, or Nehemiah to go finish building the city or to go finish or start the rebuilding of the temple. But there's only one decree, as we saw there in Ezra chapter seven, that clearly brings about a, a decree to bring about a restoration 
institution of the statehood of Jerusalem. In other words, to establish government, to establish magistrate, magistrates, and to bring back that independent statehood that was taken away from them by Nebuchadnezzar seven years before. And so what we're seeing here from 457 on, we just got to do some simple math. If you count from 457 and you just add 2,300 years to that, considering that period of a year between 1 BC and 1 AD, uh, you clearly get to the year 1844. And that's where we're kind of picking up here. I, I don't want to so much focus in on the math of that because the math is simple. The math is credible. The math is clear. Something happened in 457. Something has to happen in 1844 because God is not the author of confusion. He isn't going to give us 2,300 years prophetically, of course, bringing out a, tw a literal 2,300 year time period and then something not occur in the year 1844 as specified in Scripture. So when we study this in depth, we find that this is all within the context of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Remember Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, what did it say? Unto, the two th unto 2,300 days, or in this case years, then, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. In other words, at the end of this 2,300 year time period will be the beginning of judgment. Daniel understood, Daniel the prophet, he understood what that cleansing of the sanctuary meant. If you were within the Jewish culture, you understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant a time of judgment. And so simply by understanding that, they knew that judgment began, but the only thing Daniel didn't understand by the end of Daniel 8 was when does this thing begin so that we can learn when the judgment begins, which is at the end of this 2,300 year. Years. It's no doubt 1844, the year 1844. But what I want to spend the rest of my time on is talking about the significance of what actually is happening and the significance of what began in 1844 and what does it mean for us today. When you go to Leviticus chapter 16, of course, we know this is within the context of the Day of Atonement. The judgment day for Israel was the Day of Atonement. It was the holiest day out of the year. 359 days out of the 360 year biblical time period or biblical year, 359 days, the blood, uh, that, that sinful blood of the blood of the, of the animal or the blood of the lamb is coming in, 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 and it's just flooding that sanctuary because people are coming in. They're confessing their sins. They're doing the requirements of the sacrificial system. But then there came that holy day, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, which meant uh, it, it's be, to be at one with God in which God is going to deal with the sin record. He's going to bring atonement and he's going to bring a time of judgment uh, for those, of course, everyone, either passing from judgment into life, as we find there in Luke chapter, uh, uh, John chapter 5, in which if you brought your sins into the sanctuary, you have nothing to worry about. You simply just humble yourself before the Lord, and guess what? You know that the blood of the Lamb has covered you. But if you did not send your sins into the sanctuary, if you did not humble yourself uh, any of those other days to confess your sins and to go through the sacrificial requirements in order for your sins to be forgiven, then you had a fearful looking forward to judgment on this day. Now, I'm not going to read all of Leviticus 16 because there's a lot to consider there. But what ultimately happened on this day is the high priest only would take a bull from himself and for his household, he would offer it as a sin offering. And only by that could he appear into, past the veil into the most holy place of the, of the sanctuary. He would sprinkle some of that blood upon the uh, mercy seat, therefore cleansing himself and his household. But now he has to take a goat and there was two goats and he would cast lots and on whichever the lot fell for the Lord, he would take that particular goat and he would, the, the, the goat would be slain on behalf of all of Israel's sins that had been brought into the sanctuary during that year. And the blood of that goat would be again taken by the high priest only, past the veil, into the uh, most holy place and sprinkled up on the mercy seat, thus signifying that all of the sins that had been brought to the Lord and had been humbled and brought and appeared before the Lord in the sanctuary all that year, all of those people who had done that, that record now is being placed before the Lord and God is going to do His cleansing, atoning work in dealing with that record of sin and, and cleansing it once and for all for all of the sin that had been brought in. And of course, we can talk about the scapegoat another time. But the point we're getting at is this was a day of judgment. Once that work had been begun and once the, the, um, 
holy place had been cleansed, this was an atoning work for them. In fact, Leviticus 16, verse 16 says, So he shall make atonement for the holy place, which we mentioned, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins, so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. But when you get down to Leviticus 16, verses 29 and 30, also notice what it says. This shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. Everyone was supposed to humble themselves. They would pray toward the sanctuary, recognizing that they were sinners. And Lord, only you can deal with this sin. Only you can search me. The affliction of the soul, a deep, deep, deep spiritual inventory in which a person would humble themselves to God and say, Lord, show me my sin so that I may give it to you. And then he goes on to say, and do no work at all, whether a native or of your own country or a stranger. For on this day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, how does this equate to the year 1844? In 1844, while many of the Millerites had missed the point in thinking that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth by fire and the return of Jesus, Jesus was indeed moving not to come to this earth, but he went from the holy place, just like the high priest did from on the day of atonement, from the holy place into the most holy place. And Jesus Christ began the work of judgment in the Father's presence, taking him and his sins and the blood that he had shed for us and he had pleaded, he had laid it down before the Lord as the full atoning sacrifice for everyone. And thus, since the year 18 to 44, all the way till now, according to Revelation 14, verse 6, we have been living in what the Bible calls God's judgment hour. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan, Shelley, John, John. We've got a couple minutes for some closing thoughts. The focal point of the entire topic we've been covering today, the cleansing of the sanctuary, to me, boils down to John 1, 29. If you miss, you can miss all the days, but behold the Lamb of God mm -hmm. that takes away the sin of the world. When you find Christ, that prophecy finds significance. Mm -hmm. Don't apply it to the Antichrist. It belongs to the Christ. Amen, amen. And I encourage you to consider what Jesus has done for you and continues to do in the holy sanctuary place, in the most holy sanctuary in heaven. Mm -hmm. He is ministering in our behalf. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the week, Messiah was cut off, the middle of the 70th week, not for himself, for this purpose. First Peter 1.18, to redeem us, not by corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the blood, uh, the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without spot or blemish. Amen. Amen. As we've learned in a previous lesson, we don't have anything to worry about. This judgment is not bad news. It's great news because Jesus is both, he is both our advocate and judge. And the mm -hmm. Bible says, if you believe on the Father and believe on him, then you will pass from judgment into life. Amen. And that's why the cleansing of the sanctuary is the everlasting gospel. It is good news. And we're so glad that you have joined us as we study this good news in Revelations 3 cosmic messages. We're going to continue to study this theme. Our next lesson is lesson number seven, and it's entitled Worshiping the Creator. That's part of the three angels' messages, the three cosmic messages. So be sure and tune in next time as we continue to study this important message. <laughs>